You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome once again to a Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. This program is brought to you by the elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg and 33 congregations of the Churches of Christ in a four state area. We're happy to bring this uh, program to you without any solicitation of money whatsoever and we're just glad you're watching today. We hope you'll tell other people about this program. And we have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions, and we'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Andy Brewer. I preach for the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Hello, my name is Terrence Manis. I preach for the Troy Road Church of Christ in O'Brien, Tennessee. Hello, I'm Jeff Brown, and I work in worship with the Pleasant Hill Church of Christ at Trenton, Tennessee. Again, we're grateful to these brethren for being with us today. Our first question goes to Brother Brewer. The query says, is it true that Jews in the Old Testament prayed with their face toward Jerusalem? Where is this found? And if it is true, why did they do it? Good question. Brother Burr. Well, it's very possible it was true. And actually, we know it was true in some circumstances. To my knowledge, the only instance in the Old Testament where there is an actual reference to it, even though there may have been others, and I'm just not aware of them, we know that there's a reference to that in Daniel chapter 6. Uh, this, of course, is when Daniel has been uh, tempted, I, I guess would be a good word to, to use, uh, has, been, uh, has been targeted by certain enemies, uh, co-workers who did not like him nor the authority that he had, and uh, convinced King Darius to issue this decree that anyone who prayed to a god other than King Darius would uh, for 30 days would be sentenced to a den of lions. And it's in that context in verse 10 that we read that when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that was he, when he found out the law had been signed, the decree had been issued and put into place, it says he went into his house and he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now inserted in that verse is a parenthetical statement that says this, that as he went into his house to pray, that his windows were open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. And the indication, the assumption, even though the, the verse doesn't just clearly say that when he prayed he faced Jerusalem, because of that parenthetical statement, the assumption is that it was Daniel's practice to face Jerusalem as he prayed. And I guess he really could have done it for any number of reasons. It's possible that he could have faced Jerusalem when he prayed to remind himself of his humble background, of his homeland and the place of his, of his birth and, and his childhood and, and, and to remind him of all of that prior to him being in the position that he was at the time as a figure of authority in the Persian government. Uh, it's possible that he could have faced Jerusalem to remind him of the horrors that he had witnessed as a child, as a young man, and it motivated him to serve capably for the good of himself and his brethren. I think the last explanation is perhaps the most plausible, that he, he might have faced Jerusalem simply as a sign of respect to God and God's designation of Jerusalem as the holy city. And, and there could have been other reasons. The point, I believe, is that we don't know because the chapter doesn't say. We can speculate, and I think all of those options have merit, and there's other options that could possibly have merit. But at the end of the day, the reason why that he might have done so is, is ultimately going to be speculation outside of the Bible just outrightly saying the reason. As far as it having been a legal requirement for, uh, for Daniel to have done this or for any other Jew to have done this, I'm not aware of any legal obligation in the law of Moses that would have required them, it would have bound them to face Jerusalem and pray, as we see was Daniel's practice. Uh, it just seems that this was a personal preference 
that he chose to put into practice and that he did so with some regularity. Now, because Daniel did it and because it was a practice with him, I don't believe it would be a stretch beyond our imaginations to assume that it perhaps was a practice that many Jews uh, had in place in their lives, in their prayer lives, and that when they prayed each day, that they, they made it a point to face Jerusalem in doing so. I mean, if Daniel did it, then there's absolutely no reason why it might not have been the practice in, in other people's lives. But as far as it having to be the case, as far as them having to do it as a legal requirement under the law of Moses, uh, I know of no such requirement. Uh, it just seems to be that that was something that they chose to do personally, and it might have been for any number of reasons, but likely more so as a sign of respect and reverence to God. So I appreciate the question. I hope that that information helps. And, uh, uh, but you might just continue reading through and there might be more information that I simply overlooked. Thank you, Brother Burr. You know, I was thinking Jonah prayed in the belly of the great fish, didn't he? Uh, I don't guess he knew which way Jerusalem was, but I assume he did his best. Our next question to Brother Manus. How can I be happy in heaven if my children are lost? Brother Manus. In addressing this matter of concern, one must not resort to solutions that are contrary to plain Bible revelation. For example, universalism, the theory that all people will be saved is not in harmony with the scriptures. Matthew chapter seven and verse number 13 through 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, the Lord says, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth to life. Few there be that find it. Nor is it feeble to suggest one will have no remembrance of earthly association. For in Luke chapter 16 in verses 27, 28, the rich man, uh, he, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, concerning Father Abraham, that thou would have sent him to my father's house, that is Lazarus, who was in Abraham's bosom. The rich man request was, send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So there was remembrance of earthly association. The rich man remembered he had five brothers. It should not be argued that there will not be recognition in heaven, for clearly is not the case. The scripture teaches us that we will recognize one another in heaven. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 11, and I said unto you that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And then Luke 23 and verse number 43, Jesus said unto one of the thieves, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. God is the supreme being of love, Love is intrinsic to his very nature. First John 4 and verse number 8. God is love. The depth of his love for humanity is evident in the very gift of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. John 3 and verse 16. Man's sense of love cannot begin to ravel that of the supremely compassionate Father which is in heaven. Parental love is simply a type of representation of the love that God has for his children. The greater love is between God and man, not parental and or parent and child. As much as one might love their children, God loves us infinitely more. Our limited earthly perspective will be replaced by holy, heavenly perspective. Speaking of the eternal state in Revelation chapter 21 in verse number four says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Missing our relatives or our loved ones or our children would presumably fall upon the category of pain and mourning. We accept by faith that what God says about heaven is true and that we will experience happiness for all eternity. In heaven, Everything is made new. Everything is splendid and glorious and blessed. God has a plan to comfort his people. I hear Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4. 
The book records for us, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God is trustworthy. And if his word uh, says that we will be happy in heaven, even with the knowledge of our loved ones lost, we need to trust God and take him at his word. Right now, our focus should not be on how we can enjoy heaven without our loved ones there. Rather, we should focus on how we can teach our loved ones to obey the gospel of Christ and remain faithful so that they will be there to enjoy heaven. Teach them about God's plan of salvation and being added to the Lord's church and living a faithful Christian life. And when I look at this question, how can I be happy in heaven if my children are lost? It's an indication that there is still time, there is still opportunity to teach them the Lord's way, that they might not be lost because that is our job as a parent to teach our children the truth that they might be saved before it's everlasting and eternally too late. I consider uh, the rich man noticed that when he died, then he was concerned about his brethren. Let us be concerned about our children now while we are living and while they are living, that they might be blessed with the opportunity to obey the Lord before it's everlasting and eternally too late. We thank you for the question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is How to Have a Great Spiritual Retirement. If you'd like to have this tract, or if you'd like us to send the first lesson of our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible, or both, or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. Or email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Or call our toll free number, 1 800 436 0463. If you got the answering machine, please leave your full name and address so that we can meet your request. You can also contact us by means of our webpage. We would encourage you to go there. That's a Bible answer, uh, tv.org. You can learn more about a Bible answer and past programs. View them there. Now back to our questions for uh, Brother Brewer's next question. Please discuss, I'm sorry, for Brother Brown's question. Should the first day of the week be observed as a day of rest, even as the Sabbath was in the Old Testament? Brother Brown. Thank you for this question. As we begin to answer this question, we want to look at some differences between the Sabbath day and the first day of the week and then get into some other matters regarding this question. The patriarchs, first of all, were not commanded to observe the uh, Sabbath day. Genesis chapter 3 through Exodus chapter 15, there's no mention whatsoever of the patriarchs ever uh, observing this day. The Israelites, the Jews, however, were commanded to observe this day. They were commanded to uh, remember this day and keep it holy, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10. But the first mention of the Sabbath day being observed was in connection with Israel getting manna, Exodus chapter 16, verses 23 and following. The basis of such is given to us in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. It is there that we read, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Now Moses in writing Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and following there mentioned this, that the Sabbath day was set apart, that it was to be remembered and be uh, hallowed. But he was writing after the fact, after the creation. He was using that there to, um, I guess for lack of a better term, was using that to kind of fill in some gaps, giving us some information and then would fill in the gap with that uh, later on with them. And so the Sabbath became a sign between God and Israel 
as his special people, Exodus chapter 31, 13 through 17. This day was commanded of Israel because they had been delivered from Egypt, Egyptian bondage. They were no longer enslaved there to the Egyptians, Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15. In the New Testament, Jesus taught in the temple, Mark chapter 1, verse 21, Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. You'll also remember that it was in the temple that Jesus sparked controversy among the Jewish leaders in that He healed on the Sabbath, Mark 3, verses 1 through 6. He allowed His disciples to gather grain on the Sabbath and He caught more controversy from that. And he, the text there was telling them that they were to do no work on the Sabbath. It was a day of rest, a day that was set apart and hallowed. But the work that they were not to do was unnecessary work. You remember the example that He gave? about the ox being in the ditch? Well, it would be necessary even on the Sabbath if it was in the ditch for it to be removed. And, and so the apostles were also told to pray that their journey from tribulation, that it would not take place on the Sabbath. Mark chapter 24 and verse 24. Matthew 24 and verse 24. When Jesus died on the cross, however, the Sabbath was done away. Colossians 2, 14 through 17. Romans 7, 1 through 4. But now think about some of the significant events that took place upon the first day of the week. You'll remember it was upon the first day of the week that our Lord was resurrected, Matthew 28 and verse 1. Acts chapter 2, we see that the church was established upon the first day of the week. The Christians were told to assemble upon the first day of the week as a day of worship to the Lord. As a matter of fact, we call the, Lord, the first day of the week the Lord's Day. And you think about the events and what takes place upon that day. As we gather to worship our Heavenly Father, we sing praises to Him, Ephesians 5, 19. We pray, Acts 2 and 42. We preach and teach, Acts 20 and verse 7. We give as we have been prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. We partake of the Lord's Supper, remembering the Lord's death till He come. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 28, Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And, and so we see that, that while living under the law of Moses, the Israelites, the Jews, they were told to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It was a day of rest, a day that was set apart and sanctified for that purpose. But in the first century, we see that the early Christians... They were commanded to worship God on that day. It was the Lord's Day, a day set apart for service to Him. There were some Christians, however, very early on who did continue to observe the Sabbath day. And, uh, for example, the Ebionites were those individuals. But it was not until about the 4th, 5th, and 6th century that the practice of calling the first day of the week the Christian Sabbath came about. There were those there that said that the Christians were obligated to keep the Sabbath on Saturday. And then that was sought to enjoin the Sabbath with the first day of the week. And the Puritans of, of just a few centuries ago began to observe such that the first day of the week was the Christian Sabbath. And today many in the religious world, Catholicism and, and many Protestant denominations refer to the Lord's Day as the Christian Sabbath but they do so without authority from God. For when the Christ died on the cross, the old law was nailed to the cross. It was done away. It was no more. And today we are to uh, honor the Lord and worship upon the first day of the week, as we have said already, doing those things as He has commanded, Colossians 3 and 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord by the authority of Christ. So we cannot call the first day of the week and a day of rest as the Sabbath was for the Israelites. There is a rest that is awaiting the child of God. It is not this rest that uh, is for Israel that was uh, instituted for them, a Sabbath rest, a day of rest, nor is it a Canaan rest that was provided for Israel by Joshua. But it is a heavenly rest provided by Christ for all who faithfully serve Him. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Thank you for your question. Thank you. And now to Brother Brewer, please discuss the so-called lost books of the Bible. Brother Brewer. I'll hesitate from speaking concerning specific, uh, specifically claimed lost books of the Bible because 
And to be honest, there's so many that people claim are lost books of the Bible that we just don't have time to touch on all of them individually. And so I'm going to simply say this. There are books referred to in the Old Testament primarily that we don't have preserved for us today. Uh, most of these were books that contained the secular history of nations. They contained the, the personal records of kings. They might have been other forms of literature, but none of them would have been inspired. And so they were just kind of lost to the recesses of history for the most part. We, may, we do have some that are still uh, available to us today, but for the most part, uh, just simply have not been preserved there are the apocryphal books, and these might be the ones that the questioner was really, really had in mind. I, I just don't know. But there are the apocryphal books that some religious bodies claim should be in the canon. But when you really examine them on a deeper level, they, they just don't meet the requirements to be considered uh, canonical, to, 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 to be considered biblical books. Uh, for instance, uh, they will contain historical inaccuracies. Um, they uh, don't claim inspiration. They are filled with contradictions. Uh, they just have issues present in them that make it clear that they are not from God. And so therefore aren't preserved as, as biblical books. Uh, there are some of those apocryphal books that do contain some secular history that uh, is, is beneficial, but for the most part just simply uh, contain a lot of bad information. And then there are some other, uh, other books that uh, some claim are missing that have little to no evidence that they even existed. There might be a, a word here or a statement there in some sources or from some backgrounds that have given people assumptions that there might have been something written, but we don't really know. And so people have come to call some of those works, potential works, uh, lost books of the Bible. I remember several years ago hearing a good friend and brother uh, who, I don't know if he was preaching a sermon or if he was in a forum like this answering questions, but he, he dealt with the matter of there being lost books of the Bible or the potential of there being lost books of the Bible. And what he said has really stuck with me. And I mean, the, this was several years ago, but I, I've always remembered what he said. He said, if there are lost books of the Bible that God wrote, delivered the men, and intended for us to continue to have today, and we don't have them, then God is not God. And I sat there for a second, and I, I tried to absorb what he said. And, of course, he went on and, and gave some further explanation to what he meant. And, and the more that he explained it, the more I thought, that's exactly right. That if, if, if there are books of the Bible that we should have, but we don't, then God isn't God for this reason. God promised us that His Word was not going to pass away. That the information that, is, that, that He provided man that is relevant in view of redemption, in view of preparing our souls, in view of making sure that we have all of the information we need, to maneuver our way through this life and go to heaven, God promised that that information is go was going to be preserved and that it would be available for all of humanity throughout time. And if we don't have the preserved and completed Word of God in our possession today, then simply speaking, God didn't live up to His Word. He didn't preserve it the way that He should have and the way that He promised He would. And that would mean that He lied and therefore isn't God. Now, that obviously is not so. God is God. God is true to His Word. God did preserve the information, the text that He knew was relevant and that we needed in our lives to, 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 to study and to learn and to know and to obey. It's all simply put before us through the Bible. And so because God is God and because God has promised that His Word would be preserved and that it would be made available for us today, then uh, there aren't lost books of the Bible. 
Uh, there are works, as I said a moment ago, of the past that weren't inspired, some that have, that have faded away into history, uh, some that we have today, some that may never have even existed. Uh, but as far as, as a book being inspired of God, uh, necessary for us to, to have and to learn and to obey, uh, those are all contained in His Word uh, because God promised that we would have them available for us. And so I, I know there's a lot of other information that's out there, and uh, that might not have answered your question to the extent that you wanted, uh, but hopefully it was enough to, to help to, to concede any concerns that you might have had. Thank you. And now to Brother Manus. What does it mean to be chosen by God? 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, are some people not chosen? Brother Manus. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul says, Knowing, uh, brethren beloved, your election of God. The word chosen carries the essential, uh, the essentially the same meaning as election in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 4. In essence, uh, they have the opportunity to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent, uh, confess, and be baptized, and be added to the Lord's kingdom. All who of their own free will believe the Lord Jesus Christ died for them, obeys that gospel that Paul said he was not ashamed of, Romans 1, 16, or elected of God simply because they have complied to the terms that he instituted in his own mind before the world began, in which by his gospel, having been made known unto men, as a result, that all men are given opportunity to obey God's plan of salvation. Therefore, to the second part of the question, are some people not chosen? Well, all, uh, no, all those who are saved have chosen to obey God's plan of salvation. And that's what we have to keep in mind. God gives people, the mankind, the free will of choice to choose to obey him or not to obey him. So man has a choice whether or not to be saved or lost. We thank you for the question. Who was the preacher who used to say that in the election of the Christian, the devil's got a vote and God has a vote, but you have the deciding vote? And that's true. We have the deciding vote as to whether or not we will listen to the call of God through the gospel and believe it and obey it. We'd encourage you today to obey the gospel of Christ by faith, turning from sin, confessing Christ, and being baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.